Father, we come to you tonight and we pray that you will open up your word to us by the Spirit of God that we may see wondrous things out of your law. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures tonight, Lord, inspired, inerrant, verbally inspired. We just thank you for them. Pray that we might even go away from the conference more diligent Bible students than we've ever been before. We pray as we study the Word that we may see Christ in every line and make each faithful saying mine. Pray that we might indeed be hearers of the Word and doers as well. That we might receive the engrafted Word which is able to save our souls. Able to save them from eternal damnation and able to save them from damage in this life. Undoubtedly, Lord, there are many unspoken needs in our audience tonight. We thank you that the Spirit of God, in his own wonderful way, can take those needs and interpret them to the throne of grace tonight. We pray that that might be the case. We pray that blessing might flow out from this conference to assemblies near and far, and indeed to the uttermost parts of the earth. We ask it as we give our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I missed a question this morning. I didn't do it on purpose. It was tucked here. What does the last part of 1 Corinthians 12, 13 mean? 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Greeks, whether we be bond or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. And the question is, that expression, have, have been all made to drink into one spirit. Well, the first part of the verse says we were baptized into one body, and we went over that in detail. The expression to drink of one spirit, it says drink into in the King James. Most versions say drink of one spirit. It means to share together in the ministries of the Holy Spirit, in the blessings of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we are a community and our communion is in the blessings of the Holy Spirit. And so to drink there means to have fellowship with, to share in. And to drink of the Holy Spirit means to share in all that he has for us. Don't forget, if you want to ask questions, just leave them up here uh, on the podium. Well, let's go over the material we've covered so far as far as the ministries of the Holy Spirit. We saw that he convicts the unsaved of sin, otherwise they never would be saved, and that conviction is essential for salvation. He regenerates the wonderful work of the new birth. He places believers in the body of Christ, which we've just had, he indwells believers, all believers, and the church as well. He gives the believers a, conscious, a consciousness of sonship. We spoke about the seal of the Spirit, security, possession, destination, the earnest, the down payment, the guarantee, the engagement ring. Another comforter, speaking of the Holy Spirit as the one who comes alongside to help in every time of need, the anointing, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit that enables us to discern between truth and error, and also the sufficiency of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And then when the meeting ended uh, this morning, we were talking about the filling of the Spirit, and we were discussing how to be filled with the Spirit. And you remember we said that, first of all, uh, we practice instant confession of sin. Uh, and forsaking of sin. We don't let sin accumulate in our lives. Secondly, we said that uh, we must be continuously committed to the will of God, to the Spirit of God's control in our lives. And then I think when the hour closed, we were in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, be constantly filled with uh, the word of Christ. I want to go over that. It was so hurried.
turn first of all to Ephesians uh, chapter 5 verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 it says and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled with the spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God okay there be filled with the Spirit, which incidentally means be constantly being filled with the Spirit. Not a once for all thing, but a continual thing. And then notice what it says, speaking, singing, thanking, and submitting. You got it? Now turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 says in verse 6, 16, sorry. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. In Ephesians it says, When you're filled with the Spirit, these results follow. In Colossians it says, When the word of Christ dwells in you richly, these same results follow. At least teaching and singing which means that to be filled with the spirit is to have the word of Christ dwelling in you richly because we mentioned things equal to the same thing are equal to each other four a fourth thing be Christ centered not self centered be Christ centered not self centered John chapter 16 verse 14. We've already read it. These verses come up frequently, but it's just that there are different shades of thought. And we're going to go over this in detail later on, but it says in John 16, 14, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. We live in an age, and especially in the evangelical world, when people are taught to be self-centered, Modern counseling largely turns the searchlight in upon self. Popular preachers talk about self more than they talk about Christ. Robert Schuller wrote a book called Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. He said that the great mistake of the Reformers was that their theology was God-centered instead of man-centered. should have been man-centered. So there you are. All of these books having to do with self, self, self. No wonder people are flying apart at the seams. Dear friends, there's no victory in self. Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth... What? Yeah, it's a good lesson to learn. And never forget. No good thing. If you look within yourself for victory, you're looking in the wrong place. You have to look up to the right hand of God where the Lord Jesus is sitting Throne. A person who is filled with the Spirit is not filled with self. <laughs> you can't be filled with self and filled with the Spirit at the same time. And a person who's filled with the Spirit is glorifying Christ. That's how you can tell Spirit-filled ministry. That's how you can tell Spirit-filled teaching. It glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when the Spirit of God is at work. So, number four, be Christ-centered, uh, not self-centered. What else to do to be filled with the Spirit? Number five, go about your daily work doing the things that your hands find to do and believing that God is working in and through you. you remember how we committed our lives to the Lord at the beginning of the day? We came to Him for an exchange of will. We said, I take your will, here is my will. Well, then you go through the day and you do the work that your hands find to do. Might be dishes. Might be mopping a floor. It might be any one of those things. It's all right. Any honorable work can be done to the glory of God. And a man can be filled with the Spirit and be a street sweeper. 
plenty. It doesn't make any difference how mundane it is, how menial it is. He can do it to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where a lot of people get off the trail. They think that only platform work is spirit-filled. They think that only active witnessing is spirit-filled. But that isn't true. Some of the most spirit-filled people in the world today are behind the scenes. You never see them in public. But they're living Christ before others. And then number six, accept what happens to you as God's will for you. Don't go through life fretting, worrying, or anything else. Just accept what happens as the will of God for you. Now, the Bible tells us that there are certain results of being filled with the Spirit. You know what they are? Well, first of all, there's power. There's power. Luke chapter 24, 49. Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. It says, um, verse 48, And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. I tell you, when the Spirit of God is working through a human vessel, things are accomplished that are humanly impossible. And Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, of course, very similar to that. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, power, the power of the Holy Spirit. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, Ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. I just want to pause here to give an illustration. It was my privilege to know Fred Elliott, who was the father of Jim Elliott. And I think Fred Elliott was a spirit-filled man. And uh, one day I was standing with him outside the LaGrange Gospel Hall uh, in uh, LaGrange, Illinois. And they were right by the Burlington Railroad tracks. And just as we were talking there, our voices were drowned out by three diesel engines roaring by, carrying the California Zephyr, you know. And we just, our conversation just suspended. And, um, and when it got all through, he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, power, brother, but nothing like the power that raised him from the dead. I had thought it was just a train. <laughs> he, he saw a spiritual truth. Isn't that wonderful? He was a spirit-filled man, you know. He could relate things to the spiritual side. Another time, um, in his home in Portland, he was sitting at the table with the family, and they were having their morning devotions. He was reading the Bible. And all of a sudden, out in the yard, he heard a tremendous clatter and noise, you know. It was the garbage man coming to pick up the garbage. Fred Elliott put his Bible aside, got up from the table, went over, opened the window, and called out a cheery good morning to the garbage man. Was that right to do? To interrupt Bible reading? For that? Yes, that was very right to do. He made no distinction between the secular and the sacred. To him, that cheery greeting to the garbage man was just as sacred as reading the Bible. And I think he's right. He was a spirit-filled man. And he went through life and he did the things that his hands found to do and he did them with all his heart. Then boldness. Another result of being filled with the Spirit is boldness in the things of God. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. And this is a recurring theme in the book of Acts. I've just picked out a couple of verses here. Um, now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Acts chapter 4, 13, verse 29. Same chapter. And now, Lord, here they are. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Isn't that wonderful? Verse 31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Beautiful, isn't it? We had a young fellow in our program last year and I really believe he was continually filled with the Holy Spirit of God and he had this boldness in witness. 
One day he went into our Safeway supermarket and he saw a Greek Orthodox priest with his black clothes on and a big chain around his neck and a big cross here. And Jeff went up to him and he said, Oh, he said, I see that you're a holy man. He said, Would you mind telling me what that cross means? What an introduction. <laughs> Scene number two. They're at, they're at the meat counter, all the packaged meat. Jeff has his Bible over the packaged meat witnessing to the Greek Orthodox priest. People are trying to get their hamburger and they can't get it. <laughs> but it was a holy boldness. Was the priest offended? No. He got his telephone number and called him up later and wanted to talk to him. What is it? Filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what it is. Another of our young fellows, if you met him, he seems as meek as a mouse. He's, uh, he's an Indian he's from a Sikh family. He's got a big black bushy beard and a big black head of hair. And, but you let him go on the campus, I tell you, he's something. I went on the campus one day and I said, Paul, I didn't know you attended college here. He said, I don't. Well, I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm after souls. One day, he was speaking to a young fellow on the campus. He was witnessing, and the young fellow said, I'm not interested. Paul kept talking to him. The fellow said, I told you, I'm not interested. Paul said a few more minutes, a few more words, and the fellow walked off in high dudgeon. And Paul kept called after him, hell is for fools. The fellow came back meekly and let Paul share the gospel with him. Did you ever hear the beat of that? Boldness. If you met him, I'll tell you, the Spirit of God working in him. And that's what you have in the book of Acts. A boldness in proclaiming the truth of God. And then joy, Acts chapter 13. Joy. Wherever the Spirit of God is filling a person, he is full of joy as well. It says in verse 52, Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Dear friends, let's have a little joy. The Lord will forgive you for being a happy Christian. He really will. God hates complaining. He hates murmuring, but he loves joy. And then, of course, uh, praise. This is characteristic of uh, the filling of the Spirit. Praise. Luke chapter 1. I think these are lovely passages. Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 75. Of course, I'm not going to read them all, but you know what it is. The father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, and he opens his mouth and praise to God flows out of his mouth. The passage from 67 through 75. And then, of course, in Ephesians 5, the passage we already read. You know, giving thanks continually, a thankful heart. And then also in Ephesians chapter 5, submission, submission. A mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Not rebellion against authority, submission. The Holy Spirit filled. Now, not only does the Holy Spirit fill, but he also guides. He guides. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Let's look at that. We're going to think about the subject of guidance for just a few moments. Luke, I mean Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When you come to a verse like that, all Christians are seen in verse 14 as being led by the Spirit of God. It doesn't mean some inner circle of Christians who experience supernatural guidance. All Christians in that verse are led by the Spirit of God. And it goes on to say that they are the sons of God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 18. But if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Again, that's all Christians. If you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Christians are not under the law. They are under grace. 
This raises a question. How does the Spirit of God guide his people? Well, he guides them in many ways. He guides them through the Word of God. First of all, the Word of God contains a general outline of the will of God, doesn't it? And as we study the Word of God and saturate our minds with it and saturate our lives with it, we have it in general tune with the will of God. But he guides in specific ways, too. Uh, sometimes you're looking for the guidance of God and you read a verse of Scripture and it stands out in neon lights. Somebody else could read it that day and it wouldn't say a thing to them, but it just answers your need of the moment. Some time ago, Steve Richards was in Turkey. They had been in Turkey for years. And Steve was wondering, does the Lord want me to stay in Turkey with my family? I think they had been there 10 years or something. And he was praying about this. Lord, you want me to stay in Turkey. And one morning, he's, uh, as he's praying to the Lord, he comes to Psalm 37, verse 3. This was in his reading that morning. Psalm 37, verse 3. Now, he was reading it in the Turkish Bible, and it's just a little bit different in the Turkish Bible, which is all right. It says in the King James, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. But do you know what it says in the Turkish Bible? It says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on the faithfulness of the Lord. But that was just the guidance he needed for that day and for the days to come. Dwell in the land and feed on the faithfulness of the Lord. And on the basis of that verse, he stayed in Turkey. God spoke to him through it. Now, you could read that this morning and it wouldn't say much to you, would it? Many years ago, an uncle of mine came out from Scotland and went to Vancouver. And he was used of the Lord in seeing souls saved there in Vancouver. And then he began to wonder, I wonder, should I go back to Scotland? And as he was praying about it, he read this verse. He said, it read, um, You've compassed this mountain long enough. Arise and go toward the east. And he did. He packed up and he traveled east. And on the way, he came to my father's house in Massachusetts, stopped up. And my father was a good Presbyterian. He had family devotions. They call it family, family, family worship. They had family worship every night. Brought out the Word of God, read the Word of God, gave thanks for every meal. And so when my uncle was there, my father bowed his head and gave thanks for the food. And my uncle said to him, William, are you a Christian? My father said, oh, no, I'm not a Christian. Well, he said, you just committed a sin I never committed. My father said, what was that? Well, he said, you just called God your father, and he's not your father if you're not saved. And just that simple remark plunged my father into conviction of sin, and he was saved shortly afterwards. God really does guide through the word, doesn't he? On the basis of that verse, he left Vancouver, came to Massachusetts. My father was saved, and he went back. My, and my uncle went back to Scotland from there. God guides by the, by the word of God. And I'm sure you've all experienced that guidance in your life. I certainly have. Where verses just come alive when you need them. When you need them. I think I was mentioning up at Lake Geneva. Time I was going through a very rough patch in my life. Very, very difficult. And I was really disconsolate and didn't know which way to turn. And I got a letter from a lady and she had no idea what I was going through. She couldn't have known what I was going through. And at the bottom of the letter she wrote Psalm, she read Isaiah 49.4. She didn't quote it. She just put Isaiah 49.4 at the bottom of the letter. It says, Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. In other words, I felt that it was all in vain, but it wasn't so. It was justice with the Lord, and my work is with my God. Just the right verse for that time in my life. So God guides through the word. God guides through the example of the Lord Jesus, doesn't he? The Lord Jesus is our model, and the real test for anything is how does it appear in his sight? He guides us in that way. He guides us through circumstances, oftentimes through the timing of things. At the time in my life, I was seeking the guidance of the Lord and just the dates and the arrival of letters indicated the guidance of the Lord. 
In other words, when you see things happening in your life that would never happen according to the laws of chance or probability, you know God is working. You're before the Lord. You're crying to him for guidance. He shows it. You know it. He guides oftentimes through the counsel of others. Through the counsel of others. I think in seeking counsel, a good thing to go to older, godly, mature people. Don't go to people who tell you what you want to know, what you want to hear at least. Go to people who will be objective, who are spiritual, who know the word of God. It doesn't mean you have to take their advice, but you, take the, but you listen to their advice and you weigh it in the balances of the sanctuary and let God speak to you through it. And then there is a way, I believe, in which God guides through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And this one you have to be very, very careful of, and I'll tell you why. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. It says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Or some versions of the Bible say arbitrate. It really means let the peace of Christ umpire in your hearts. To the which you are also called in one body and be thankful. I think I've been talking to people these last two weeks seeking the guidance of God. And maybe there are two pathways open to them. I say, do you have peace about this one? They say, no. Do you have peace about this one? Yeah, well, let the peace of Christ arbitrate in your heart. Let, let the peace of Christ. But, but be careful. Anything that's subjective like that, you have to be awfully careful. You hear people saying, the Lord told me to do this. And you know very well he didn't tell them because it's contrary to the word of God. You have to be very careful when it's subjective, when it's that inward uh, voice. But I believe the Spirit of God can uh, guide us in that way. Now, I'd just like to share a few rules of thumb that I follow in seeking the guidance of the Lord. I ask the Lord to confirm the guidance in the mouths of two or three witnesses. I say to the Lord, Lord, you know how simple I am. And if you just show me one indication of you, will, I might miss it. But if you show me two or three, I won't miss it. Well, you're really quoting his word to him because God says in the mouths of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. So you're saying to the Lord, Lord, do as you have said. You said that. Now I'm calling upon you to do it. Will he do it? Yes, he'll do it. One of the greatest crises in my life. Uh, I did that. I was praying about going overseas with Operation Mobilization in 1964. And I wrote to an unsaved friend in New York. He had been with me in the Navy, and he was with a public relations company in New York. And I said to him, you know, I've been praying about going overseas uh, with Operation Mobilization, and all I'm waiting for is a green light from the Lord. It was October 23rd, I wrote to him, 1964. Christmas came, I got a letter from him and his family, at least a card, but no letter. January 1st, I thought, I think the Lord's going to answer. I think the Lord's going to answer. I got down on my knees. The Lord confirmed the guidance of the mouths of two or three witnesses. February 9th, I got a letter from my friend. He said, your dog-eared letter of October 23rd is still before me. You said you were waiting for a green light. He said, if you're, all you're waiting for is a green light, he said, why don't you accept the slogan of a brochure that I've just been preparing for the European Travel Commission. And out of the letter fell this brochure and it said, why wait till sometime? It's so easy to go to Europe now. <laughs> Seriously, I still have the brochure. And this is an unsaved man that God is using. So I got down on my knees that night and I said, Lord, I really believe you spoke it. It spoke loudly to me. I said, I really believe you spoke, but remember, I asked for two or three witnesses. The next day, February 10th, I got a letter from a former Emmaus student who was going overseas. And I had sent, when I heard he was going over, I had sent him a little gift of fellowship, and he wrote to me, he said, you know, he said, the Lord's been sending the foot soldiers, he was kind of a fresh kid, he said, the Lord's been sending the, 
the foot soldiers over uh, for a long time. I was wondering when he's going to be sending some of the big guns, Dash, like yourself. <laughs> well, that really hit me hard. It really hit me hard. I got down on my knees that night and I said, Lord, I asked you for two or three witnesses. If you give me two, I'll go. But the Lord wasn't through with me yet. <laughs> February 11th, something happened that I'm not at liberty to discuss. It would reflect unfavorably on others, but I got down on my knees that night and I said, Lord, I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb. <laughs> yeah, really. You know what I believe? I believe if you're really seeking the guidance of God, you'll never miss it. If you're sincere with the Lord, and that might be an encouragement to some of you tonight. I believe some of you are seeking to know which way the Lord wants you to go. If you're really sincere, you mean business with the Lord, I don't think you'll ever miss it. Guidance at any particular moment might be very dim and indistinct, but when you look back, you'll say, Jesus led me all the way. I really believe that. So, ask the Lord to confirm the guidance in, in the mouths of two or three witnesses. Then, keep busy for the Lord. While you're waiting for the Lord to guide you, keep busy. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. God guides ships in motion. He really does. I want to tell you, it's while the shepherds were out tending their sheep that the angels visited them. That's when the angels still visit us, when we're busy. One of those shepherds that night in Bethlehem could have said, I'm just tired of taking care of these dumb sheep. I think I'll go into Bethlehem for a pizza. <laughs> well, he could have done that, but he'd have missed the angels. Do the work that the Lord assigns to you and be happy in doing it. Then I go by this little rule. If you're looking for guidance and no guidance comes, God's guidance is for you to stay where you are. That's not bad, is it? It's true, too. If you're looking for God's guidance and no guidance comes, God's guidance is for you to stay right where you are. Darkness about going is light about staying. You go back to the pillar cloud in the Old Testament. When the pillar cloud moved, they were to move. If the pillar cloud didn't move, they were not to move. Israel was not to set forth on the journey. It's the same today. Wait for the pillar cloud to move. And then finally, I would say this, and I go by this rule. Wait until the guidance is so clear that to refuse would be positive disobedience. And I believe God will honor that. You say, oh, that's what I don't like to do is wait. Join the club. It's the hardest thing for me to do is waiting. You say, oh, the world's perishing. i got to get out. I know the world was perishing when Jesus was in the carpenter shop in Nazareth too, wasn't it? But he waited. He time. And then at age 30, God led him forth to redeem the world. God knows what he's doing. And we have to wait until the guidance is so clear that to refuse that guidance would be positive disobedience and God will bless you uh, as you do that okay let's look at another ministry of the Holy Spirit you didn't know this was going to open up so many doors did you the Holy Spirit prays for believers and I'm so glad he does Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 verse 26 Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know, that's a wonderful thing. I hope you rejoice in that verse as I do. We don't know what to pray for as we are doing. We really don't. We do the best we can. But for instance, we don't know what's best for us. Maybe a loved one is sick. How do you pray? I don't know how to pray. What a wonderful comfort it is to know the Spirit of God is praying for us. It's groaning. 
which cannot be uttered. And God can interpret those groans. You know what that says to me? It says the most spiritual prayer is a groan. Because that's what the Spirit of God is. And incidentally, it's the Spirit's groans, not ours, isn't it? It's the, it's the Spirit of God in that verse that's groaning and not we ourselves. But the wonderful thing is he makes intercession for us according to the will of God. That's really tremendous. And sitting here in the room tonight, you and I cannot know what we owe to the prayers of the Lord Jesus and to the prayers of the Holy Spirit on our behalf. But someday we'll know. Someday God's going to unroll the canvas and we'll see how he was praying for us according to the will of God. And that explains a lot in our Christian lives. Now, I think I'll just start on the next one. We won't get very far, but I'd like to start on the next one, and that is that he gives gifts. And, of course, I can't read all of that, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 31, but we're going to be spending some time in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. Incidentally, that hymn on chapter 13 was very appropriate tonight, wasn't it? Here tonight, by way of introduction, I just want to do a little detective work with you about the gifts. I'd like to do a little detective work with you and ask the question, what was going on in Corinth anyway that brought forth these chapters 12, 13, and 14? Well, the first thing I'd like to uh, tell you is this. First little bit of detective work. The saints were exalting the spectacular gifts above the edifying gifts. Now, let me show you. You have to read between the lines. Chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. It's okay to desire spiritual gifts, but there are some that are preferable to others. That rather that ye may prophesy. Verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. And verses 18 and 19. I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all, howbeit in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. In other words, they were exalting spectacular gifts, we might call them sign gifts, above edifying gifts. That's the first thing. Secondly, they were exalting the gifts of the Spirit above the fruit of the Spirit. They were exalting the gifts of the Spirit above the fruit of the Spirit. How do you know? Because verse 13 says it. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love. Love is the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? He said, I am become as sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy, one of the gifts and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, nothing. They were exalting the gifts of the Spirit above the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul is correcting that in these passages of Scripture. It says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, have not love, it profiteth me nothing. I read recently of one of the early martyrs of the Christian church who was faithful as to Christ. He was going to be put to death. And they led him out to the stake where he was going to be burned. And as they led him out to the stake, a Christian who had wronged him rushed out to plead for forgiveness. And as the martyr was walking on to the stake, he brushed him aside. 
wouldn't have anything to do with him. A man pleading for forgiveness wouldn't have anything to do with him. And that man's never been listed among the martyrs of the Christian church. His name has never been listed. Though I give my body to be burned and have not loved, it profits me nothing. Third, they were insisting that everyone should have one particular gift. How do you know that? Well, chapter 12, verse 11. Chapter 12, verse 11 says, but all these work of the one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. And then verses 28 through 30. God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all, are all apostles. And the way that's written in the original language of the New Testament, it requires a no answer. It says, not all are, are apostles, are they? <laughs> or prophets, or teachers, or workers of miracles. All do not have the gifts of healing, do they? I don't know that it says that in any of the modern versions, but that's really the thought here. It requires a negative answer. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The implied answer is no. So they were insisting that everyone should have one particular gift. Paul is correcting that here. Next, they were using the gifts for self rather than for others. They were using the gifts for self-edification or for self-display rather than for others. Paul corrects that in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. It says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That means for the profit of all. Why did God give you a gift? For yourself? No. So that you can benefit others. That's why the gifts were given. We were not intended to be the terminals of the blessing, but channels of the blessing to others. And then in chapter 13, of course, the whole emphasis of chapter 13 is love thinks of others, not of self. That's why chapter 13 is here. Love thinks of others, not of self. Verse 4 of chapter 13, love suffers long, is kind, love envies not. It goes right on down the list what love does and what love thinks. Chapter 14, verse 4. He that speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Ah, but he that prophesies edifies the church. That's the difference. They were using these gifts for self, not for others. They weren't intended to be used that way. Then they were using the gifts as a child uses a toy. So does it say that? Well, look at chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. He's saying, don't act childishly. In the use of the gifts, don't act childishly. I'll explain that in just a minute. And then chapter 14, verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. In malice be children, but in understanding be men. There it is, the idea of children again. What was happening? Well, a man would get up in the assembly in Corinth and he would speak in a tongue and there was no interpretation. And nobody understood a word he was saying. And Paul is saying that's using it as a toy, as a child uses a toy. It was never intended to be used that way. Nobody understands what you're saying. You might as well not be talking at all. And then, of course, they were exalting themselves over others, weren't they? They were exalting themselves over others. And that's why Paul, in chapter 12, uses the illustration of the human body. There's diversity in the human body, but there's interdependence, too, you know? Many different members, yet there's a unity there, and the members are dependent upon one another. So some were made to feel inferior while others consider themselves self-sufficient and independent. Chapter 12, verses 12 through 27.